you know, all for one, one for all, you're all fighting for the same cause. You, and you don't know what's coming around the corner for yeah. all, you know, it's not going to happen, but you're still, I'm just blocking. My yeah. Head. I was like, <laughs> uh, I, I was wondering if you were being really poetic about the way you're angling. <laughs> you like, I was like, is this a new, like, <laughs> What's up, everybody, and welcome to Drinks with Johnny. On the show today, I am joined by probably our most requested guest in our Drinks with Johnny Discord server. You can find that in the description down below if you're interested. But at any rate, I am joined by, of course, Miles Kennedy of the band Alter Bridge, Slash and the Conspirators, his own solo projects. The list goes on and on of the man's accomplishments in the music industry. I'm really excited to have him here on the show and chat a little bit about that, his vocal techniques, of course, and just so much more. I know that he's a big advocate for uh, animals. He's got a he's got a great pet and a great story there. So I'm really excited to have Miles on the show today, as I know most of you out there are as well. So let's get to it. Looks like he's uh, just about ready. So uh, let's start the show. Hey, <laughs> hey, what's up, Miles? How you doing today, man? Good. How are you doing? Man, uh, I've been having a little bit of a uh, deja vu. Otherwise, I'm doing great. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. I love talking with you. This is great. Yeah, man. Thanks again for doing this uh, for a second time. Uh, for the listeners and viewers at home uh, that don't know, uh, this is now the second time I've had uh, Miles on the show, technically. You guys had, didn't get a chance to see that episode because uh, I lost the file. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was really crazy though, man. I don't know, like, there's a lot of technical uh, things that could happen when I'm doing these podcasts. I've learned over the last couple of years of doing it. And for all you guys out there starting a podcast or a show like this, don't feel bad when you when this shit happens. I've talked to a lot of other people who have done it even longer than me. It happens all the time. But this one was rare for me, dude. I got I to gotta tell you a quick story about how it happened. I took my computer with me, uh, my Mac Mini. I probably should just get a laptop and have a separate one to travel with. At any rate, my computer guy is actually the one who works on it was somehow logged in. I took it with me to Pennsylvania. He sees that there's a, a computer logged into his account in Pennsylvania and says, that's not me. So in, what happens is Apple security works too well. It doesn't, Interesting. it completely, instead of just knocking me off of that iCloud server or whatever that I didn't even know I was connected to it completely zeroed out my entire computer. Weird. Like remotely. Did you know that, 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 that even, that, that even no. happened? That's, cr that's crazy. <laughs> well, I mean, it kind of makes me feel good in a way to know that Apple's on it to that degree. Right. But, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, you know, I try my best to, to handle those said technical difficulties that might happen from time to time. But this one was just like, I was like, I, how the fuck was I even supposed to know that was going to happen? Like there was no right? backing of that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, it's all good. We're, uh, we're here. We're going to have a great time. Absolutely, man. Um, I heard you, uh, you, you've been doing some press all day, so uh, I, I hope uh, your voice is going to hold up. in this. <laughs> no, it's, it's good. It's good. Um, I had to dust the cobwebs off. It, this is a good, you, you caught me in like, you start to kind of get your rhythm at this point. I'm, right. I've been out for like 90 minutes, but yeah, initially you, you can't string sentences to get, at least I can't in, in, in the, in the morning. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh. in fact, I woke up this morning and I was like, oh man, uh, you know, it's just like, how am I going to get this stupid brain to work? Coffee. That's coffee. How. Yeah. You got coffee, that metal show. Did you get that? Were you oh, yeah. from being on there? Is that? Yeah. I got that yeah. from being on there. I don't know. Geez. That was quite a while ago, but uh, yeah, I, I covet this cup. I love this. Yeah. Cup. It's a great <laughs> show. Are they, I, I talked to them uh, not too long ago um, and they were talking about possibly bringing it back as like a, a web series kind of thing or a podcast. Like, um, but I don't think that that has come to fruition. Unfortunately. I heard that too. I, I hope they do. I mean, I thought it was great. Yeah. You know, they have, I mean, they had great guests, obviously. I mean, they had well, great guests. Well, with the yeah. exception of me, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ratings, ratings went way down when I was on. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. I doubt that. But um, a lot of these, a lot of these things that we're going to talk about, we already covered the last time, but you know, I'm, I'm excited because 
I could get a little deeper into it. Are you ready for that? Because I'm like, I'm like, I'm more ingratiated now with your new record for Alter Bridge, uh, Pawns and Kings, than I was then. You know, I, cool. I listened to it a bit, but now I've like listened to it a lot a bit. Okay. So I wanted to start cool. there if you're okay with that. And uh, yeah, absolutely. One of the things I noticed more and more listening to it is the actual recording. We talked a little bit about that before, but um, who was the producer and mixer on this? Because what I loved about the actual sonic uh, uh, compartment of, of the album is it didn't sound overproduced. There's a lot of records right now that are, you know, we don't need to name names or anything like that, but they have the same triggers on the drums. They have the same shit. And it's like, a little bit of that, you know, to clean it up and polish it is cool, but it, I like the way, in particular, the drums and the snare sounds on this record. It sounds a, quite a bit more natural than some of the other records I'm, I'm hearing these days. Yeah, Elvis, so Michael Basquette, um, we call him Elvis because he looks like Elvis. <laughs> um, and he's been making, we've been working together off and on, or really mostly on since, two th well, the first record I ever did with him was in 2000 he was an engineer and he just done he he'd engineered the the make yourself record uh, mm -hmm. the incubus record oh, and he'd done record. it yeah he done he just was on he was kind of on a tear and he was just getting started he was he was very young so that's where i first met him made uh, he was engineering the second mayfield four record and um then fast forward to about 2000 was it 2007 when we did Blackbird and we we brought him in to do the second the the second Alter Bridge record and he's been at the helm ever since um and he's just he's great I mean he's yeah. not only is he great great at getting sounds um but he's got a really strong arrangement sense and uh he's got he's got song chops you know so that's that's been a really He's been a, in a very important asset, I feel, uh, especially with Mark and I, because we bring in a lot of ideas, and he's really he's able to help us filter the ideas, and and we'll you know take the here's the good stuff, <laughs> here's what we're going to work on, and 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 you know understands how to put on the kid gloves and work with our fragile musician egos. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a very underrated uh, uh, attribute of a producer. Like I, I think that's maybe like, the most important. Yeah, yeah. When they can when they can bridge that gap between two artists like yourselves writing and, and you know bringing stuff to the table and right yeah that could get that could get hairy sometimes you need that you need that outside perspective everyone every once in a while yeah. right yeah I, I, absolutely i know i do i mean i get lost if i i'm always amazed i don't know about you but when you hear about artists that produce their own records like prince there was an example and clearly he did a good job of it but i i i don't think i would be up for that job because i i need somebody to say okay this could be better or have you thought about approaching it this way um yeah that's it's 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 important is that so that actually begs the question for me um i've noticed it i guess for myself but like in a band you know there's for us there's four or five guys working on the same uh you know our overarching art for an album so where there's a little bit of checks and balances just in that and our writing and then demoing and stuff like that as a solo artist, I, I wouldn't, that I agree with you would be way more difficult. Like if you're just writing from, you know, picking up the guitar for the first time, doing the riffs for the melodies to recording it, producing everything like that, like Prince did, that would be a whole other thing. Um, that actually brings me to your solo stuff though. That's, is that not how you're doing your solo records? Well, yeah, as far as the the writing process, and that is a real that was a challenge because especially on the second one on Ides of March, you know the world had shut down, yeah. so I really had to go in my studio and trust my instincts from the from the arrangements, you know, obviously from the songs, but also the arrangements and you know putting together these realized demos that then I would hand over to to my band. Um, and yeah, that was really, that was a tremendous amount of work. Um, it was good for me. And I think it kind of tightened my, my studio chops a little bit, but, uh, I do like the idea of like with Alter Bridge where I look at it, like if I'm submitting a demo, it's, a, mm -hmm. I look at it like a shell. So I'll, I'll come in with, here's, here's, here's like the intro, here's a riff, here's the verse, here's the chorus. And then I like to leave like a middle section, like, okay, Mark, what do you, what do you have? That's going to complement this. Cause it does two things. It takes it into a territory that I might not have thought of. And it also, my, my songwriting partner, 
he feels involved with the song as opposed to you just hand in a completed song. Here's everything. Everybody play exactly what I hear. Drummer doesn't want to have to play my crappy drum programming anyway. <laughs> you know? So, so it's like, I, I feel very uh, passionate about that, that yeah. you, everybody has to take ownership of the song. Otherwise, you know, it's just, it's different. And I'm yeah. sure you guys probably the same thing yeah i mean each song is different right it, it, on every album it, it it changes from riff to riff even note to note it sometimes it feels like how much each person is involved in, in everything but by the end of it i feel like in our band by the end of it when we're ready to put it out everyone's put a put a, a fingertip at least in each song of some kind so it really does feel like ours because i mean you know we've we've talked about it before um in uh, other interviews and stuff like and Avenge, there's songs when we had Jimmy the Rep Sullivan with us and he would just come with these entire opuses, like little piece of heaven just done and we're like and all in his head and we're like, Well, we ain't gonna fuck fucking touch that. That you gotta go. <laughs> like, let's, <laughs> we'll play it and fucking let's put it out, you know. And there, there's right. there's seldom moments, but there are moments like that where something like that will happen. But then the album as a whole kind of takes shape with everyone uh contributing, right? And that's a beautiful, and, and that's great because then there's that chemical reaction and it's that some of its parts, you know, you create this, this thing that would not have existed had you not all put your heads into it. Right. Um, I, yeah. I, I, I love that. You know, I think that's really important. Yeah. Well, th I think that you guys, your new record, I've heard the whole thing. Most of the people have only heard four of the songs, right. That are out right now, but mm -hmm. It's also it's also great we had to redo this. This is gonna be closer to your album release now. It's coming out <laughs> October fourteenth, so perfect. <laughs> it, it works out timing wise a little better. But um, I'm excited for everyone to hear the rest of the the songs. I mean, the, the two that they've heard that I've already into is like Sin After Sin, and uh, the last song. Um, uh, why am I drawing a blank? Uh, silver Silver Tongue or Silver Tongue's the first one that right well, for the second song. I I got my phone right here, man. I'm already. <laughs> Uh, Ponds and Kings. Is Ponds the, and Kings, yeah, right, yeah, right, right. The, the one that's, I, I, again, we, we talked about it before because it was like the second one you guys had released for this record, uh, Ponds and Kings. And it's the last song on the record, which was like, that's 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 a, that's a different to me. A lot of times you, right. you, you're at least like song one or two and song four, and then the record right. comes out. Right. So talk to me about like how that song got chosen to be one of the ones you're going to release um, before the before the record comes out. That was a surprise for me as well, because that was a song that I wasn't even going to make the record. That was a song, <clears throat> like as far as we talked about that whole process of demoing. Right. I, and I had, I had been whittling away on that one for a while and, and just had all these parts. And when it, I had plenty of other demos that were f more fully realized. And so I put those up on, the, on our, you know, our folder. Mm. And then, it, but you know, sometimes you're sitting there at the after all the songs are up, and the producer will be like, "Hey, do you guys have any other songs you didn't submit?" And I'm like, "Well, yeah, I've got a, a bunch, but you're not gonna, you know, it's, they're not really ready to go. Let me hear it." So I I played that, and he's like, "That's going on the record." It's like, "Oh, geez, all right." So fortunately, we got it in the uh, context, and, and it became alter bridgeified. You know, we was we were able to kind of whittle down all the all of the parts and and make it a, a realized vision. And so, but with that said, I was surprised it even made the cut to make the record. And then when it was the one of the first tracks to be released, it just goes to show you, just like what we were talking about. It's just so important to have other uh, other people ex you know outside of your uh, what you're doing with fresh perspective it's that fresh perspective that totally you know will make her make or break things in a lot of ways because you get so you know you you're, you're, you're looking at every little detail every little hammer on pull off and you know whatever is going on and you're like oh it's you know you just you're too locked in so it's it's good to have that that uh, those people you trust absolutely and then as you you know as we were talking about when everybody gets a little a little part of it, you know, you you come with this song and then you alter bridgeify it, as you said, you know, and then it becomes what we get to hear now. And like I said, it's just it's one of my favorite records on the song, even um, oh, cool. on it. So I mean, it's just really cool. I'm I'm glad I'm glad someone uh, told you it needed to make the record there. So. <laughs> <laughs> and me too. <laughs> <laughs> I was just it's funny though because um, on another like personal note, I was just listening to it yesterday. I was on my way to the the Raiders game. I know they fucking lost. Right, fuck off. Um, 
And uh, I picked up my buddy who's a big Chargers fan. I've known him since fifth grade. He's like, he's like my best friend in the world. We go to the, this game every year. And I had uh, just been listening to the record over the weekend again. And it was on the, on the speakers in the car. And he was like, what is that? And I was like, oh, it's, it's a new Alter Bridge. And he was like, oh, shit, that sounds really fucking good. And then like we continued listening to it. And uh, I just let you know that he, oh, well, that's that he, cool. had, he had a fan out of that. And he's... He likes good music for the most part. You know, he likes my band, so it's all right. <laughs> well, no, I, I appreciate that. You know, you, it's, it's just like we were talking about. It. Sometimes you you just don't know. You know, you, you spend so much time kind of immersed in the in the process, right? And you you'll sometimes you by the time you're done, you don't know if it's good anymore. You're yeah. just like, well, <clears throat> I hope people like it. <laughs> and how, and it's been, and to that point, it's been done for how long now? Like, I mean, from demoing to, to getting it done and then sitting on it waiting. So a lot of people at home may not understand how long that process can really be and how long you've lived with the songs before they first hear them. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 fortunately, <clears throat> this record's kind of unique in that sense in that the, I, I don't think I started really trying to, put things together till about December of last year. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, and you know how it is that it can be a year or years prior to an album release where you have, you start, you know, building the ideas. Um, so these, these songs kind of feel like they're fresh out of the oven, <laughs> you know, there's that. That's there's, good. So you're, you're ready for that tour you guys announced too. You got a big, big tour coming up next year. So exactly. starting in January. So you guys are fresh and ready for it. Fresh and ready. Maybe that's what we'll call the tour. <laughs> it should be like a hot loaf of bread or something. We'll sell Alter Bridge loaves of bread out of fresh out of the oven. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I hope that makes at least one of the one of the admins for the, for the for the, for the tour. <laughs> I'll credit you. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be great. Just gotta have the butter just like kind of melting over it somehow. Oh yeah. Yeah. Some garlic butter. It'll be delightful. Well, I'll just have my graphic guy, Brandon. You got to put that look like, on the corner of this video. <laughs> uh, see, now we're having fun. Now we're back to having fun. Right, man. right, right. Uh, so we can transition from music real quick because there was uh, you shared an amazing story on the last time that we had this chat about your time on the set of the movie Rockstar, and it really stuck with me. And I was I was hoping you'd be able to share a little bit more from that. I know. You know, uh, for everyone at home who hasn't seen the movie for whatever reason, go check it out. It's an amazing movie uh, based on loosely on the true story of Judas Priest uh, uh, when they uh, replaced Halford for a little while. Um, at any rate, you have a role in the movie um, as a as a fan, you know, coming up and taking taking control of the stage. There's Zach Wilds in the show. There's some other people. Um, but t walk me through that set and how you even got into acting and kind of as we talked about last time, why you haven't, why we haven't seen you in a movie since, man. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I think the main reason you haven't seen me in a movie since is because I discovered that actors get up really, really early. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> wow. Yeah, that was my first and only acting experience. But how it happened was I was, it was, it was kind of strange. I was just hanging out on, you know, up here in Spokane where I live, Spokane, Washington, and I get a call from my manager and he's like, yeah, there's, and I'd heard this movie was being made. I'd heard there were other artists involved with the movie, <clears throat> but I was really surprised when they reached out. I was just like, okay, well, great. I, I how did you even hear about? Because at the time, I just had a Mayfield Four record under my belt, um, and it was through Brendan O'Brien who had mixed the first Mayfield Four record. And I guess guess he'd kind of submitted my name into the hat because they wanted somebody who could sing the part but also kind of look the part whatever mm -hmm. and i guess once they, <laughs> they they had a nice outfit they were gonna they were gonna put on whoever wait yeah that wasn't that wasn't what you showed up with that le that red yeah. leather that red leather suit wasn't what you showed up with the the the, <laughs> the, the, the leather suit and that hair that was yeah. not my hair it's amazing how many people think that was my hair i was like i wish i had hair like that. <laughs> pretty, i think you could i think you could pull it off i think you could pull it off miles i don't know that's a pretty uh pretty uh <laughs> massive head of hair um, <laughs> but but yeah it was so it was like that's that's how i get, get, how it happened so i went down and read for the part 
and to my surprise got it and then went into the studio and they wanted to make sure i could sing the the song and uh yeah it was it was a trip i mean i just didn't understand the magnitude at least at the time of how hollywood worked and just like how much went into all of that and getting to to see the behind the scenes and and uh it was really really incredible like i remember one time i was standing there we were waiting to shoot or we were rehearsing it was during rehearsals and i had these sunglasses and somehow the sunglasses they something broke there's no big deal i just put my sunglasses in my pocket mm. and somehow somebody found out oh we heard your, your sunglasses broke we'll get somebody to fix those for you i'm like this is great this wouldn't <laughs> happen in the studio <laughs> Here you go and yeah. fix my sunglasses. Like they have a professional sunglass fixer, you know, on these big budget. Dude, I got to get me one of those. I didn't know that, that existed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it was just, it, but I say that to illustrate the magnitude of it, you know, right. just how it just so much, so much different than the, being in the music industry. And um, it was cool. I mean, I getting to hang out with Zach Wild and and meeting Jason Bonham and and Jeff Pilson was great. Everybody was great and, and Mark Wahlberg was great and it was just a really cool experience. And you know, the last when we finished filming, Zach, you could you know, he's just a, a great guy. And and he said, Hey, why don't we have a why don't we have a beer? And he took me in his trailer and we you know, we talked to him. He kind of lit up when he found out my my grandfather was was a marine in World War II, and we got to talking about that a little oh, bit. Oh shit, and, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, so we were like, you know, just I'm just hanging out with Zach Wild, and then I told him I also play guitar, and so he gives me a box of his custom guitar strings. I think they were I forget which brand they were at the time, but but it was just sorry. That's my dog Mozart. He's freaking out. Oh, um, I was I wasn't sure if that was your dog or or. Uh... Oh, maybe it is your that, dog. Yeah, that might be my dog. Oh, okay, okay. It's actually not my dog. We're dog sitting, and she's a bit Oh, you of are? A, yeah, she's a bit of a yapper. What kind of dog is it? Oh, it's a complete mutt that they found. Uh, her name is Sola for uh, South L.A. They've, uh, my, my friend is a, is a teacher, uh, elementary school teacher, and the dog was left in a box behind the elementary school. Oh, man. So they took her in and named her Sola south la so uh nice, yeah nice. so and that i mean she's older they've had her for a lot of years now but they're uh so we're dog sitting and she she's not used to the used to the house so any sounds outside she's sure. uh, she's barking but i like i, I, I could have just let it ride with you though man now now i feel like <laughs> like i'm ruining the the chat <laughs> no no i actually i should have put it on you it was like yeah that was totally mozart that was i have no idea what that was <laughs> no, I, I, you're you're talking to the right guy for dogs entering into the because I man I love dogs like yeah. I just think they're the best I don't care if they're big dogs the little guys they're just I'm a dog that, person it's too. that unconditional love right yeah it's great but I've become a cat person too because we during the pandemic we the, I don't want to say we adopted it it adopted us we had this feral cat that would wander around the neighborhood beautiful black cat looked like somebody took a panther and put it in a dryer. And it was just like, we'll put just, it in a, oh, cause it's well, fluffy. It's massive, cause it's, oh, okay, a, yeah, yeah. it's a massive cat. It's a big cat and it looks like a panther, but you just, just shrunk down a little bit anyway. So it kind of took, took a liking to my wife. My wife would be out working in the garden and this cat would just sit there and stare at Selena, kind of creepy. I'd watch the whole thing go down. I was like, what is going on out there? And then before you know it, that she started to kind of build a bond. And now, I mean, he, he's wandering around somewhere in the house and mm. he's a cool cat his name's Azriel. named him after the angel of death wow so black and, and kind of <laughs> a ominous. black black panther named israel all right yeah. or, uh, Azriel, sorry Azriel. <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible yeah i mean i know you uh, you're a big uh, we didn't get into it too much when I mean, we talked a little bit about mozart and how uh uh y you did that song for the last uh slash in the conspirators um uh record from the perspective, the perspective rather of the dog, um, yeah, and that, that that was interesting, you know. That was, and you 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 tell the story a little bit about that real quick before we get back to Rockstar. Sure, sure, yeah. That was so. What was that? Fill my world. I think was the name of that song. And yeah, wow. What? How did that go down? So we were on our way back. I was finishing up a tour, and my wife was with me. And we normally the dog is like at a dog 
sitting place and they you know dog hotel and when, when we're on the road and he loves it there and uh, and they love him which is great but we thought we were going to be back this this evening so we had somebody drop the dog off the house and we were going to leave the airport and everything's gonna be cool well long story short the storm rolls in and we can't the plane can't land so he's at the house and we, we're watching him on the cameras and he he's <laughs> i don't know about if you've seen this with dogs, but they don't like storms, they don't like thunder and they don't like lightning. It just freaks them out. Right. So or fireworks, our dogs are, Oh you know, my, that's fireworks. the worst, yeah. right? Oh yeah. It can be. Yeah. We, we've learned to do like the CBD or, or THC right. like little pills just to like calm them down and stuff on, on 4th of July. So that's a pretty big celebration down here in mean. Huntington. I don't know if you're aware. It's like pretty big celebration here. I dig that's that. same. No, it's the same thing. So we, we go out to this place and it would happen this summer and, and we do the same thing, wow. CBD, the whole thing for him. Yeah. And his people will basically shoot fire, like, like industrial strength fireworks into the lake. Like, yeah. <laughs> and like just a few houses down. It's great and, for us to be able to see, but not so much for the dogs. <laughs> exactly. And he just freaks, he just freaks out. So, so, so yeah, that's, that's definitely something that dogs <laughs> don't seem to like. So anyways, the sto- yeah, the storm rolls in and we're watching the dog and it's, it's it breaking our hearts because he's just panicked and we're not there to take care of him. So the song is written from his perspective, you know, the idea of, you know, please, please come back and 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 but but it's if you didn't know that story you'd think it was about humans so it could apply to like more of a romantic scenario or losing somebody or whatever it is but it was truth be told written from mozart's perspective yeah Yeah. (laughs) mozart's perspective too just has a nice ring to it not not, like if you don't know the name of of miles dog (laughs) mozart's perspective (laughs) also is a is a is pretty funny it's it's, it's, there's layers to that there miles i like it (laughs) <laughs> but no, and moreover, the one thing that we didn't get a, a chance to talk about is I know that uh, I read somewhere or, or our fan, one of our fans that uh, helped actually give me like a bunch of these notes, like one of your biggest fans is uh, in our discord. And as I said before, you're one of the most requested guests we've had here on the show. And she's sending me this stuff. And apparently uh, you've, you've been a bit of an activist in some uh, animal uh, fun, uh, can you talk to me a little bit about how, how that's worked out for, or what you've uh, done for animals in uh, your activism? Yeah. You know, just a few years ago, it was about 10 years ago. I did something in, in Africa and was with slash and, and, and a few others. And long story short, it was my first experience with elephants. And mm-hmm. I just was my, both my wife and I, both Selena and I were like, catch. So just uh, spellbound by these incredible creatures. And then we got to talking with one of our kind of guides who's also very, very involved with a number of things down there pertaining to the animals. And, and he was telling us about you know, the poaching problem and all that. So essentially mm-hmm. for a while there, we were involved with um, just trying to help raise awareness between the poaching with elephants and, and rhinos as well. And um, um, I mean, there was a song we did in two, it was on the, I believe it's on the world on fire record. It's been so many years, um, Mm. years ago we did basically we had a video that, and it's been so long and I'm trying to remember the exact, (laughs) it's been, that's how many records I've made since then. Jeez, Miles. Um, That's that's a good problem to have. (laughs) Well, yes and no, but it's it's, sometimes you're like, really dude, you can't remember the name of your own songs anymore, but it has been when you have three different bands, it does get to the point where you're like, good Lord. Um, but, but yeah, it's, so that was, that was something that, um, that we were involved with for a while. And, and, um, yeah, and elephants are, they're amazing. You know, there's, if you've ever stood near one or like underneath one and just, there's something it's hard to articulate, but you, you feel, you can just kind of feel this presence that's so majestic and powerful man i don't know if i've ever experienced it with another creature it's just well obviously they're so massive but they're right. but you know but you, they're so intelligent too and i think that's some that's some of the allure for me is just knowing there's so much going on um behind those those you know big beautiful tusks yeah and, man uh, yeah i've never i've never been underneath or anything close like that uh, i guess my only real interaction with elephants other than uh, you know like a safari zoo or something like that was first time i was out in thailand uh, I noticed that they were 
I don't know if the they're smaller or what, but they were like riding the elephants like that, like like horseback. But it was elephant, right. and it wasn't part of a tour or anything like that. Like it was literally these people alongside the freeway. That's how they were commuting was riding the backs of of elephants. So, right. I'm sure you've been out to Thailand a couple of times and seen, uh, or even um, the Philippines or some places like this and seen some of that going on. Yeah, yeah, I've seen, definitely seen seen some of that going on and and you know there's also and that's a tricky one with some with a, with a lot of that stuff once you kind of learn about um especially with tour with the tourist industry and whatnot mm-hmm. it's it's kind of a it can be kind of controversial as far as what they're actually doing to the elephants and 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 so and i didn't know any of that that was the thing that yeah. some, of our, some of the friends that we met through through some of these causes you know educate us they're like yeah that's some of that some of that stuff isn't always good and and so that was that was good to to understand but um yeah i i just think that you know they're uh some of the most incredible creatures on the planet I hope, I hope to experience that one day as well i have not one of the places i haven't been able to uh, visit yet is uh, africa so you said at the beginning that's that's where you were out uh, uh doing this and uh, have you been back to, have, is this someplace you've been to more than once or have you only been to the continent uh that time i was i went back was it 2018 I went for my solo for for it was like one of the first solo runs. You did you and, went out uh, just for just for Miles Kennedy solo. Yeah, in, in just acoustic. Just I acoustic. Just, went, you know, just flew down with like now, some. Acoustic. See now I'm picturing Miles Kennedy going to the airport with just his acoustic guitar on his back, ready to go to all these places in Africa. That's that that's have a guitar will travel. That is <laughs> awesome, man. That that's it was, incredible. I I lo- and I love doing that stuff because. The thing is, is when you just show up with some acoustic guitars, you've got, I mean, you're at, you're putting yourself out there. And one of the things, I don't have a problem being a dork. I, I, look, I'm I, I'm kind of a, kind of a goofy guy, and I and I embrace that <laughs> as the years go on. I'm not going to try in front. And when you're just going out there with acoustic guitars, that will kind of come through. Or you'll just say, "Did I really just say that?" Oh no! But <laughs> you're keeping it like a conversation because it's yeah. not like a big production. It's not like a show. It's more like you're in a room with a bunch of people, and you're 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 you know sharing songs and sharing stories, and 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 that's really fun. So with that said. Yeah, I've got to got to go down there and do a little safari and that was cool. What there was one thing, I don't know if I've ever told this story. We were at this place and it was beautiful and they were wonderful to us. But this mm-hmm. on this one occasion and it was just kind of a fluke. My wife was getting ready to get, you know, lights were turn off the lights, getting ready to go to sleep. And all of a sudden, I just hear this shriek. And it was in Selena and I look, oh my God, what's wrong? And she's just pointing at the floor and there was this, I kid you not, it was, it was a scorpion about this big, oh, shit. massive black scorpion that she just about stepped on when she got into bed. I mean, like that close to step on. And we, Damn. so we did some research and we reached out to our buddy who educated us about the, the elephants and whatnot and said, Hey, what do you know? About? And he took a picture of the scorpion. What do you know about the scorpion? And he's like, well, what I know is, is that particular scorpion, if you'd have stepped on it, the tour would have been over. You could have been in the hospital for weeks. Like, so she really kind of dodged a bullet on that one. But with that said, I mean, that's part of the, that's part of the um, dynamic of, 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 you know, going on safaris and going into the, the, the animal's world, you know, we're just guests. And that's what's kind of cool about it. Just try not to get stung by a scorpion in the process. Yeah, exactly. You don't, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you nailed it right there. I mean, it, it is cool to go see them in their natural environment. I mean, that's cool. Yeah. I, mean, and, I mean, kind of in our natural environment, you know, if you really break it down. But and, and right. it's cool to like go back to that and see that a little bit and safely. <laughs> Thank God she didn't. That didn't happen to her. You know? right. but, but that's still cool. You got to see a big ass fucking scorpion like that oh. right next to your bed. That's rad. <laughs> it's massive. It was. I've never seen anything quite like it. And I guess the bigger, at least in that part of the world, the bigger that the stinger is, the tail. I guess mm-hmm. the more you know, potent it is. And it was. Ah. Yeah, so it's it not a like one. a lot of spiders. So, so sometimes the spider. I don't know. I'm I'm probably fucking this up. But like uh, some arachnid. Uh, Ologists or whatever they're called could could, could, could 
<laughs> but like, I feel like in spiders, like sometimes it's the smaller ones, or sometimes with other animals, it's the smaller ones. That yeah, are that's more true. Or that is true. And, and I think it's that way. It can be that way with certain scorpions as well. But I guess for whatever like reason, that one. particular one. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not a scorpion specialist. <laughs> Although I do love the band, the scorpions. But They're a great band. <laughs> and then you got, you got other things like that, that might be a tied into it, like Sting, you know, like the, 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 you know, that's a great. Nice. Both. I'm, a, I'm actually a big, I love Sting. I, I am too. I mean, yeah. I mean, well, first of all, who the fuck isn't? I mean, well, we're talking about the musician and songwriter Sting, and of course, but I'm also a big fan of the wrestler Sting too. So, like the wrestler yeah. Sting, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we're just gonna go down this whole rabbit hole now thing of insects and uh, venomous creatures um, and wrestling and wrestling. <laughs> we did talk a little bit about wrestling uh, before. You I mean uh, Alter Bridge has been doing the Edge from WWE's entrance yeah. music for a long time. Um, he's he was in a feud with, uh, I forgot the name last time we talked, but hey, we get another take at this. Um, Judgment Day is a, is like his like big feud right now. And they, I think they revamped that song a little bit. I don't know if you're, if you guys were aware of that. Yeah. So um, the song, they're using a different song now. They're mm -hmm. using, um, I think the other side and uh, which is cool. I and mean, it's like, it's, I, I we're just flattered that they're, they're still using stuff from our catalog um so that's a uh, that's great and it, it's it, it's fascinating because i i feel like in a lot of ways the, having metalingus as his entrance music is arguably one of the most important uh aspects of people discovering the bands over the years you know we've toured especially right. overseas like if we go somewhere um and, and if someone would come up and be like man i had no idea who you were but i i love that entrance music and then i then i discovered the band after that and so that's been great for us i mean we really are appreciative of that yeah i mean it's a great song too and the fact that they're using it then the other side now um have you had uh, any chances of meeting edge yeah or, yeah yeah what's i he, met what's him he like because he's cool he's yeah. a massive man i mean yeah <laughs> he, yeah he's great they, they, they mostly tend to be i've, I've met a yeah. few and they, they, those wrestlers tend to be a little bigger than they look on tv they they are uh they're they're, <clears throat> they're giants and Built uh, different <laughs> but what's fascinating is how like when you see them out of that realm and they and they're articulate and they're you know very professional and um yeah i mean that that's the thing that kind of at first you're like you you expect that entity that you see on stage and then <clears throat> you get the other side of it which is which is really cool yeah i met him at uh it was at a house of blues in Orlando in probably 2004, like one of our first shows. And he was, he, he came to the show and I met him, met him briefly. He was really cool. Yeah. I love that Orlando house of blues, by the way, too. Yeah. I've been there in a long time, but that's, yeah. that's a cool one. You when was the first time you guys played there? First time? Shit. Probably around that time too, actually. By me. Okay. Maybe two, maybe 2003, 2004. Right. Probably had to have been around the same time because we did... I remember my first tour with the band was in 2002, just on the West Coast, like a two-week thing. And then we worked on our, our record, Waking the Fall, in 2003, released that, and did Warp Tour. And shortly after that is when we started to play some of the House of Blues a little bit more regularly. So I would imagine it was probably around that same time. Right, right. Now, you guys were, were you guys Warner Brothers initially? We were initially hopeless records. Well, there was another uh, label even before that that uh, you know the guys had signed with that was from a Belgian like company or something. They, uh -huh. Literally by like snail mail, they sent the contract. Uh, you know the guys uh, were eighteen at the time and were like, "Yeah, we got a record label, signed it, and sent it back." Oh, it really? Like, yeah, it was it was a big debacle on that. But then we got picked up by Hopeless. Um, okay. And we did uh, Sounding the Seven Trumpet and Waking the Fallen on Hopeless Records. Okay. And then um, uh, then we got signed to Warner after that. Okay. Do you remember, do you, it was, do you, know, do you know who Andy Alphon is? Uh, yeah, he's one of my very, very good oh, friends. Yeah. Andy's, Andy's awesome. So Dude, Andy. That's so funny because I, every time I see you, Miles, I feel like you could be in the Oliphant family. Like just by your, like, you look. <laughs> The way you talk and the way you look, I'm like, God, he reminds me of Andy so much. I'm so oh, weird. No That's kidding. weird that you brought it up and I didn't. Cause <laughs> How wild. Andy's, so I've known, yeah, he's ahead. the best. I've known Andy since he was the very first A&R guy that 
gave a, a gave a damn about anything I was a part of. Uh, it was Mayfield Four. He came. He flew to Spokane. Oh, shit. Yeah, in two thousand six. Yeah, in I think it was in two thousand six or two thousand early two thousand. And I'm sorry, nineteen ninety six. That's how long. Okay. That's going way back, way way back. Yeah, because I was gonna say I thought the Mayfield Four was uh, yeah, yeah. was a little earlier yeah. than that. But. That was earlier. Yeah. So he was the very first guy. I'll never forget. We, he, he gets here and we go like have pancakes somewhere and i'm like this is like this is great we're talking to like a real a r guy and we kind of actually i'm going to reach out to him because i haven't talked to him in a while but we i if i remember correctly i think we went to the rockstar premiere i think i i think i might have well his brother was in the movie his Timothy's, in the movie. it, it yeah. plays the the guitar player of mark's uh marky mark's original band mark original mark. band i'm always going to say marky mark i cannot say mark Wahlberg anymore i don't know why <laughs> I just, uh, it's it's i know it's, he's beyond that at this point probably in his career but i still i just it's just funny I, to me I, 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 i'm a I huge know. fan but like anyways i digress <laughs> yeah timothy uh timothy oliphant is great too i'm sure you guys uh he's great met on that set as well yeah uh, I've, I've only had the pleasure of talking with timothy a couple of times too but yeah andy was the guy it's funny we have a similar story he was the guy at warner that came out and saw us on warp tour for the first time and then brought out craig aronson and tom wally to the next show and he, he was the one that saw us first and was like we got to get this band blah 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 and he was the one really championing us to to come over to warner brothers that's cool how that's that's wild that is <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's he's great in fact I, I i don't know if i ever told this story either so i i think i rode with him to the premiere of rockstar rad big hollywood thing right and i'm this kid from spokane and the mag once again the magnitude of all of this is i'm like i'm kind of a wall i'm not really hardwired for a lot of that stuff so he we, he pulls up and i think he's like okay there's like the red carpet you know with all the people and the red carpet and he's like okay it's your time you're in the movie go go do your thing i i'm pretty sure this is how it played out and me being me what did i do I went behind. I went behind all the photographers and just like <laughs> docked the whole red carpet because I'm just like I can't do this. Get is do like it, setting my social anxiety off into a tizzy. I'm just get me into the theater. I love that. And this is and this this kind of answers the earlier question why we haven't seen Miles in a movie since. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. I ran for the hills. Yeah, it's like I mean it was it's cool. It's amazing, but it's just a whole different scene and and it's and it, I yeah, I'm I'm happy being a musician. I just yeah. want to rock. You just want to rock. Yeah. And you don't want to wake up that early, obviously. No. No. But let's get back. I'm going to come back to the Mayfield Four and uh, and Andy Oliphant in a second, but this seems like a good time to get back to that uh, the the set of Rockstar story. Um, you were mentioning before to me uh, that there was there was a moment where you were like going to be there was like a, a body double or something along the line it had so, had something to do with a body double with Mark with Mark Wahlberg. I almost said Marky Mark again, and. Uh, and then there was another celebrity that walked by at one point. Can you yeah. Tell, can you tell me that story again a little bit? Yeah. So I think I know which story, story you're talking about. So we finished. So <clears throat> the scenes, it was like, it was shot over three days for my part. And the first day, if I remember correctly, they brought in like a few actual bands. Like I th maybe Wasp was there. There were like some, some bands that would draw a lot of that like rock and roll crowd so they so, so they could when the film in the in the arena and stuff yeah, like that yeah gotcha. exactly so they could have the, the people in there and so we were shooting these scenes i'm dressed with the wig and the, the outfit and all of that um and we get done and i'm heading back to my trailer and <clears throat> i felt like an idiot I'm, I'm not gonna lie i just did i just didn't feel c comfortable for some reason at, at that moment just wearing this outfit it, it took me a while because i was day one that was day one of the shoot by the end yeah, of it you i was have your shirt off the streets yeah yeah and you had your shirt off under yet you're you're emulating mark Wahlberg's character and the thing and ob obviously what mark Wahlberg is ridiculously jacked even to this jacked. day he's oh, yeah. ridiculously yeah. good and you're like and i think you were talking about how you felt a little incompetent in the same outfit oh, yeah. incompetence <laughs> an understatement because when we when i read for the part i was like okay so do you want me to to attempt 
because Mark Wahlberg is known for being very healthy. And at, th at that period, I was kind of still in the middle of my party phase. Mm -hmm. I discovered the, the, the magic powers of, of, of cocony beer. And, and so, <laughs> so I was, yes. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, exactly. So I'm, the, I'm kind of the skinny, like no muscle definition thing. And then I've got, I've got like this little beer gut going and I'm like, well, obviously I'm going to want to lose that for the part because, you know, I'm trying to emulate Mark and they're like, no, no, we're going to talk to Mark and try and because it's more, rock, we want him to be more, a little more like tone, tone that down and be a little more rock and roll or whatever. I'm like, okay, so do I change then? They're like, nope, just keep doing what you're doing. I'm like, great. <laughs> Pass me another kokanee. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> and, and, and so, so I show up to the set when we started shooting and I, and he comes out of the trailer. And I'm just like, he's, he's just ripped. And I'm like, and I look down and I'm like, oh man. So yeah, there's this, you can see it. There's one scene where we're both going for this high note and we both kind of lean back, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, the long note and everything. And our coats both kind of go back and he's just this chiseled, you know, perfect specimen. And then my coat comes back and you kind of just see, you can set a drink on it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I got to go back and watch this for that scene alone. I've, I grew up loving this movie, by the way, or not even like it's, it's a staple, man. I it has a good story, right? Too in it. Like, in it all does. Seriousness, it's it has ripper, kind of great story. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, and, uh, and some amazing, uh, mu I mean, I don't know who the, who was the music director on this? Cause I mean, it, it was a, it was really well done musically too, yeah. to come up with those originals, original songs in there too, that really fit the era if that, that they were yeah. going for. Yeah, there were a lot of really good tracks that were perfect for that. I think um, I think the song that we sang, the Stand Up and Shout song, if I'm not mistaken, was written by, I think it was Sammy Hagar, um, I think wrote that, wrote that track. And uh, yeah, the, 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 the gentleman who was um, in Steelheart, great singer, um, he was, I know he was involved. Um, Jeff Scott Soto was involved with doing the, like a lot of the, the vocals. I think he did a fair amount of vocals for some of the other actors. And yeah, I mean, it was just kind of a, a, a real, f I'm with you. I mean, it was, that was a fun, that the eighties, that was a fun time. And mm -hmm. I felt like they did a good job of, of, of touching on the spirit of all of that. Um, and, and yeah, it was something that, and also I had no idea that it was going to have the staying power because when it was released, it was right on the heels of, or right before it was right around nine 11 when that happened. So was obviously yeah, that's a, yeah, that. yeah, that's a buzzkill right there. So you're kind of like, well, that's, you know, out of respect for everything that was going on in the world at the time, a, a party movie about, you know, eighties rock is not going to probably, you know, you just, you assume that's it. And yeah, Fast forward 20 years later and it's gradually kind of, you know, made it's made the rounds and, and, uh, people seem to find certain they joy still in find it. it. Yeah, and they're still finding the movie, you know, now with streaming yeah. services and stuff. And I know yeah. before even streaming services, it was, I, I would catch it on MTV two or VH VH one well, you know, when they right. started make their trend started making their transition into completely negating music. Um, right. on, 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 on those channels, they they were still playing like the, the some movies that were music r related and right. Rockstar was one of them that I got to imagine. I, I mean, the residuals on that for whoever gets paid on those got got to be looking pretty uh, these days. Not me. <laughs> I didn't even. In fact, I think you're supposed. To, someone said, "Did you get your SAG card?" I don't because I wasn't. I didn't come up in the the whole actor world, so I didn't oh, have a. Never had I a SAG card or anything. No, I didn't know any of that stuff. No one told well, me. Oh, and back then it was separated. So now, as you know, I think you know the uh, after and SAG like are combined. That's why. Oh, they are. So I don't know. Do you, you get those DVDs in the mail for when the uh, for your consideration and stuff? I don't. Really, so I, I should probably get on that. I should, should probably, probably get on that. So I get these DVDs every year for like my consideration as being part of the union or whatever, or something oh, wow. along those lines. And we get well, those sent every year. So I mean, it's silly now. Now I feel bad because I'm like, 
this just is like a waste of plastic. I, I'm kind of environmentally friendly. I'm like, this is kind of just a waste. Like, I can stream it in HD, and you're sending me a 480 DVD, man. Like, that's, <laughs> that's a good point. I didn't even, I didn't even think about. Send that. me a code or something. You know, what I mean? like, <laughs> exactly. It's like they're sending eight track tapes for your consideration. I gotta, I gotta pull out the DVD player and dust it off and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right it's that's funny somebody i was just at a at a gathering a few nights ago and a, and a real good friend of ours gave us a dvd to check out I, it, was, it was some some movie like a gladiator movie something that they were mm -hmm. like you gotta check this out it's really cool and um but then my wife and i got in the car like do we do we have a dvd player still like where, where you know, it's just like <laughs> one of those things <laughs> we gotta track recently, one of those down you're gonna have to track one of those days i recently was doing some cleaning in my basement and i found I found an audio cassette player. Oh, rad! And I'm just like, and I started looking through my audio cassettes. That I don't even know do if they still work. Do you still have a, still, like a bunch? I have a few, but the most important ones, the ones that I'm really eager to dig up, are the rehearsals because I used to record, you know, just the bo crappy boombox recordings of our rehearsals when I like in in high school. Um, and so I want to hear, that's what I want to hear. I want to find those. Those are going to be some, there's going to be some real gems. You know, my, my voice hadn't even changed yet. So I'm like, <laughs> hey guys, let's play some scorpions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean that at, at some point that might've been a little easier without the, without the knowledge to hit those higher notes some of the times. Right. Yeah. But at that point I wasn't singing. That's what's that's interesting. Right, Cause I, you started out as a guitar player. You had no I interest in singing. No interest. I got talked into doing, there was a, a battle of the bands. It was called the Drug Free Rock Off. And it was supposed to like, it was like a battle of the bands where there was a thing for the kids to do on a Friday night. And it was the theory. The theory was it would be drug free. I don't know. I don't know what was going on. I have no idea. <laughs> oh, yeah. Miles is, is watching himself of what happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Actually, it's true. At that point, I was a total, I didn't discover, like, I went through a phase. Let's just say that the, you know, I went through a little phase of kind of experimenting in my later 20s. But at that yeah. point, yeah, as a teenager, okay. I was a total. Squeaky clean uh, teenager. Okay. Pretty squeaky clean pretty boring <laughs> i just wanted to rock right so anyways we get we get up there and i got talked into doing strangely enough i got talked into doing rock and roll because my i was the only kid who hadn't hit puberty yet and i could hit the no, hit the notes and that was it so we did the, the zeppelin tune and then we did we think we did uh something from 20, 2012 by rush somebody did that and then and we were just trading vocals but that was it um and then I didn't sing again for for a few years. I just wanted to play guitar. Yeah, I yeah. just wanted to shred. <laughs> and we're, um, Anna, again from the Discord, pointed out too, weren't you a, a, a guitar teacher at one point? Did you teach guitar in Spokane? Yeah, I taught, I taught guitar for quite a while. I was kind of, I was, I was just trying to kind of hustle. You know, I'd play mm -hmm. gigs at night. I'd do session work. I'd play on like, you know, people would hire me to play on whatever, play guitar. Um, and then I, then I teach in the back of a music store and, and that was really great for me because, you know, if a student would bring in something, like I had this one student, she was amazing. She brought in, she wanted to learn and she's only like 14. She wanted to learn eruption. Mm. I'm like, okay. So that means I got to transcribe it. So we yeah. sat there took two, like two months every week and she'd just sit there patiently and I'd sit there, you know transcribe transcribe an eruption and and uh, had you already known uh, how to play that at that point or i that, knew parts some, of it yeah because a, a lot of times you know i know that you learn parts of something that you really right. love but you know the finger tapping part i knew yeah to, okay cool so yeah right. and i i, I want to ask a, while you were talking about that i was just do is there a part of you that ever misses that mo those moments where you were kind of hustling you were you were very ingratiated in in the music um and just every day every morning every night was music for you it it man i loved it mm -hmm. I, i'll never forget the first day of going to, i went to music school for like two years and got a degree in uh commercial music jazz studies and and I'm, i remember that first day it was just all music no english no math all I did was music all day and then I'd go gig at night mm -hmm. and it was like f f it was six nights a week. So we'd gig at this place called Gatsby's here in Spokane when it was open. And that was four sets, um, four sets. Yeah. Six nights a week. 
and then get up and have to go to music theory at eight in the morning and then, and then, you know, jazz improv. And it was just, but it was just all day, every day. And then teaching on the weekends during the day, if I wasn't going to school, but I, yeah, I was, I was hustling. I was just like trying to survive. And then once I got out of school two years later, then I was really hustling because I'm trying to eat, you know, and I'm trying to pay the insurance on my, on my big 1977 station wagon. <laughs> you had a 77 station wagon. Yes. The Chiquita. It was this massive. So my grandfather, he worked for uh, GM and, and I basically. And, Is this the same uh, grandfather that was a World War II? Uh, yes. Um, yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So he worked for G for Pontiac for like a long 40 years or something crazy so i basically yeah inherited this station wagon that by that point was already i don't know 13 years old or whatever it was it was it was old and 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 i was not cool driving the station wagon my friends all here comes miles driving the chiquita because it was yellow it was this massive it was like the family truckster from vacation <laughs> <laughs> holiday <Yeah>. road <laughs> oh, that, that movie is the best it's so good. i love this i love the theme song i love the movie so much the uh, holiday road comes on i'm yeah. fucking ready to go <laughs> Isn't that, i think it's lindsey buckingham is if it I'm not, i think so it's yeah. a great song it is a great song it's the only thing i know it from that's i mean like I've never it's, really heard it outside of those yeah, movies. Yeah, me neither. It's, it's but there's so many little lines from that movie. Like my, it's just kind of a, like the John Candy when they show up to the park. And, Sorry, folks, park's closed. Moose out front should have told you. Yeah. <laughs> little things like that. It's <laughs> it's so, such a great movie. But I mean, the, the station wagon, did you call it the Chiquita, the Chiquita. right? Yeah. Chiquita, yellow station wagon. I just got to paint the picture here, man. <laughs> and everybody got yellow station wagon cruising around, hustling from gig to gig, from, from teaching teaching school to going to school and gigging just to pay the yep. bills, paying on a 77. That, by the way, that's a legendary car. Like, it might not have been cool at the time, but you think about it now. I think that's got to be, if I see someone driving around a station wagon right now from the 70s, mad respect just mad respect mad respect, mad respect. <laughs> and even better if they put a lift kit on it <laughs> we actually that we actually uh, remind uh, you remember gremlins or the amc pacers remember those cars yeah they were really the gremlins funny. was a uh, was made famous by uh wayne's world the the, the exactly Starsmobile. yeah exactly well there was one here where i live for for years i don't know who the guy was but he mad props to him wherever you are he'd put a math he'd put a lift kit he'd utilize a lift kit gremlin. with the gremlin and it was so cool like <laughs> so but did he the have top. the licorice dispenser i gotta know if he had the licorice dispenser <laughs> i'm sure he did sure he <laughs> in did. my mind he definitely had that <laughs> no i i bring up like the the love for the music at that at that point just to i don't know maybe for some of the listeners and people at home like you're living you're eating you're breathing it and you know trying to pay the bills on it struggling to pay the bills but as you said, you still loved that moment, you know, and I just want to point out to people who might get discouraged that they won't maybe make it on the stage that, that you're, you're, you or I are sharing and stuff like that to, the, to that degree. If you love the music, if you have that passion for the music, you can, you can absolutely make a career out of it in, in, in many different ways, right? And still share that love that, that you and I both do, right? Absolutely. I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. Cause I think that's really important. You know, it's that there was a guy that I got turned on to around that period. And he's like comparative philosophies and religions. And his, 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 his name was um, Joseph Campbell. And he had like the saying, it was follow your bliss. It was the idea of, you know, at least the way I take that is, you know, do what you love. And, and I have lived my life by that. And it, and it, I'm I'm so glad that I have because I'm I love it I love what I do I'm I'm following my bliss and and not only do I get to make myself happy but I see it make the people that I'm performing for happy as well um, not everybody but some people <laughs> <laughs> well those festivals where you're opening up for somebody else exactly you know, like, you're uh, always gonna we've have all had those shows yeah, we've all right. had those shows there's always that <laughs> especially guy early out. on we go back to those 2004 days you know. <laughs> Oh, I know. Those were those were the days. But still, you know, you're 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 doing what you love, right. and and even if it's not, and I think that's what what's really interesting. Like when I think back to those hungry days, when I was like, I was just getting by. You know, I'd get a mm -hmm. dollar, 
I get, I'd take a dollar and go down when I was working at this music store and I, there was a, uh, an Asian restaurant. I'd spend a dollar on this little box of rice and that's what I'd eat for lunch pretty much every day. Cause that's all I could afford. But there's a certain like, now that I think about it, even though it was probably, probably wasn't the healthiest thing in the world, there's a certain romance to all that. And it's like, you're paying your dues and you're hustling and you're, and, and I'll never forget we did our first record with Jerry Harrison, Mayfield Ford did. Um, so we ended up after meeting people like Andy and whatnot, we ended up signing with us with the Epic records and we used uh, Jerry Harrison, who was the guitar player for the talking heads. And he produced that first record with Mayfield. Oh, shit, I didn't really, I, and, was, yeah. I was going to ask you that was, but that, you just nailed it. I mean, yeah. He just That's done like that. the big live the records and he was, yeah, he was on, he was, he was on fire and I learned a lot from him. And, but he said that he said these, these are the times you're going to remember when you're out mm -hmm. touring in a van, when you're barely able to get by. This is the stuff you will remember and you'll look back with the fondest memories. And he, he, it turned out to be right. Not that I don't love doing what we're, you know, traveling in buses and course, playing big yeah. stages. That's amazing. That's the dream, right? But there's also something about that whole, you know, all for one, one for all. You're all fighting for the same cause. You and you don't know what's coming around the corner. For yeah. all you know, it's not going to happen. But you're still. I'm just blocking. <laughs> yeah, I was like, uh, I, I was wondering if you were being really poetic about the way you're angling. Like, I was like, is this a new like? <laughs> I was waiting for like the most poetic like ending go. to that to that soliloquy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm an oh idiot. that no. is fantastic. <laughs> no, but I think I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it is it is for me too. Those are like very fond memories. I mean, I I didn't even go to college or a music school of any kind. The road was my college. The road was my music right. school. Um and I still, you know, to this day, it seems like it was just yesterday in so many ways. And I'm still with the same guys. I've, and I understand how incredibly fortunate I am to have gotten to the position that I'm at, the position that you're at, how fortunate we are. But my point is to all that is I don't think it would have changed, aside from the monetary and the quote unquote fame, whatever that is, the passion for music would have still been there no matter what. And I would have found a way of something to do in music. Um, whether it is eventually having to get a nine to five job and then gig, gig on the nights and weekends it's, or whatever it may be working at a studio, finding that, that, that thing, you know, cause it, it's true. We we're very fortunate to get to, to, for whatever reason, the stars aligned and we get to do what we do on stage as well, you know? And I think it's important for people to hear that, you know, I know for myself and I imagine for you, it just, we're very humbled by that. It's not like we're sitting there going, oh, I made this happen, fucking right. all that shit. You know that the stars are aligning for that because there's so much talent out there. I mean, you've, you've taught so much talent over the years, I'm sure. Yeah. And, and you find, you find yourself going, why, you, you, I don't know, I've asked myself this a billion times, why me? Yeah. You know, like, why did I, how did this happen? Because I do, I know guys who are way, I grew up, gosh, the guy I grew up in, in that band with when we, you know, playing that bar, even though, you know, six nights a week, Joel was his name. Mm. He's way better guitar player than I was. And he's one of the best guitar players I've ever, to this day, he was, he was like a prodigy. And it's like, you know, it's, so it's like, I realize how crazy lucky I've been and it sounds like you do too. And that's, that, that's great because I think it makes us. A obviously appreciate what we do and not take it for granted, but it also makes you work harder. Yeah. You know, it's like you. I, for me, I still feel that kind of you kind of trying to prove yourself. That you're still always, fucking, especially out among hey. your peers. You gotta, you gotta. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I just, I just hope that people watching and listening at home um, who are looking to have a career in music and stuff like that take that to heart and uh, really listen to what Miles is saying here. It's, uh, it's really important if. To like you said, follow your bliss and whatever yes. that is. And if music Damn. is your bliss, don't ever give it up. Don't, it doesn't matter. Don't ever give it up. Um, anyways, let's get back to Mayfield Four real quick, and then we'll wrap it up by the end of that rock star story. Because okay, we, cool. Because it, it, it's just too good how we're compartmenting this the rock right. star set of, uh, <laughs> of that filming. But I wanted to ask a little bit more about uh, Mayfield Four and how you got uh, Mark uh, from Alter Bridge oh. together. And, because there was a really fun transition to me in there. Um, in Mayfield 4, you guys were doing like a lot of R&B influence stuff, right? Like, yeah. You did well, some I'm, covers and stuff. We did. We did a cover of a, um, hold on one second. Mozart has Mozart's made it his parents. Yeah, there it is. Mozart. 
So it's Sola and Mozart. We're going to have to get these yeah. two together at some we, point. We are. Hey, well, now he's he's taken off. Okay, good. Hopefully it'll <laughs> stay that way. He's it's, it's very demanding. Um, <clears throat> geez, he's such a... No. Oh, he's got monkey. Okay, you got monkey. Okay, you're good. Oh, he's, he's got, got his, he's got his got his toy. His toy, yeah. yeah so that's she should be good. So yeah, um, <clears throat> so so Mayfield, we did, we loved, we loved, you know, rock and roll. Like Zia and I, the the drummer, we were in that band together back as kids. The with even the, the audio cassettes I was talking about. You know, he was the drummer, and we were playing a lot of these rock songs. But then as the '90s came about, then we discovered like Jeff Buckley, and we discovered Radiohead, and but we also discovered like Marvin Gaye and Stevie Wonder and we were absorbing all this music trying to figure out how to kind of do our thing so we covered on the first Mayfield 4 record we covered um, Inner City Blues by Marvin Gaye which is one of my favorite songs of all times one of the most badass bass lines ever I mean it's just such a groovy bass line and so we we covered that and um just to kind of as a tip of the hat um, to, to to all of that and what it meant meant to us. So then fast forward, you know, I don't know. Well, we toured. We ended up doing a tour on uh, on that record, and we opened for Creed just as they were blowing up. So this was like '98, and that's when I had brief interaction with some of those guys, and then got a call in like five years later, four years later, whatever it was, when they were interested in putting another project together and then as of january 2nd in 2004 you know alter bridge was born yeah. yeah and and so and i know mark has a little bit of a uh um jazz backgrounds and you had a little bit of the r&b backgrounds and uh we were talking a little bit about uh, uh records and and vinyl and and your cassettes and stuff you guys you guys must have been sharing um you know a lot of a lot of the record collections sharing songs with each other right earlier on or not it's interesting early on um so for me i even though i came from kind of a, a jazz and fusion and r&b background i mm. didn't i didn't know mark was into that and i don't know if he was at that point to the degree that he is now it seems like he's really gotten into you know frank sinatra and the great american songbook which i think as a songwriter is so important because those songs yes. were they're such well-crafted songs and so I'm really happy to see that. So now it's we just did a press run over over in, in Europe, and it's great because we're talking about these versions of these songs and these crooners who sang them, and and I and I think that I think that's important, you know, other than just being locked in the in the hard rock or metal genre, is that you you pull from these other these other influences. I mean, that's one of the things I mean, we've talked we talked about my love for the Beatles, yeah. and and since then I've gone just absolutely like crazy i'm i don't know what's going on but it's been beatles or george harrison for months here at the house like it's driving my wife crazy <laughs> and i've really really gotten into that first george harrison solo record um and, it's, a great and one, man. it's so good it's so good and and but what you realize is what he did brilliantly was he took all these different influences you know he was studying with Robbie Shanker and, and he had yeah. these obviously had his, his rock chops but he also had this multiple uh, multiple genres he was integrating into what he was doing which gave him his his musical voice and I think that that's that's really important that's I agree really important. I agree man I, I think I think that's one thing that uh, yeah, I understood when I was like a teenager like I was like a well, young teenager when I discovered punk rock it's all I listened to and I listened to metal before that, and I was like, I was abandoning metal for a while. I was like, oh, no, I don't like that shit anymore. Right, right, I don't right. like one genre. And now I'm like, you know, as a kid, you don't know any better. But, like, it's so funny to see now. It's just like, it's all music. It's all art. It's all, there's something great right. in all of it. You know what I mean? It's, just, it's, 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 it's a human creation when you really break it down to what it is. So it's like, it's beautiful at some, at some level in every genre. And uh, to be able to pull from that. I mean, I, I rarely, li I don't know about you, but I rarely listen to hard rock music anymore. I'm, I mean, I still create it sometimes, you know, but we're a pretty eccentric band, you know, we, we, we're kind of all over the place. Um, but when I'm listening to music, when I'm just going to chill, and I'm not even just chill, but I'm going to listen to music, period. It's rare that I'm listening to hard rock these days. I gotta, I gotta yeah. admit it. I know. It's funny. I, f I feel the exact same way. Uh, and I think that's just part of just discovering all the, there's just so many great 
flavors to to take in musically and it's just it's it's kind of mind-blowing really but while i the way i look at it is while i'm on this planet i want to absorb as much of it as i can and enjoy as much of it as i can and then when we go into our roles as rock guys you somehow you've integrated that into your musical dna and then hopefully you can spit it out in a unique way to what you've absorbed yeah. you know and i guess that if you just listen to the classic like great hard rock and metal records that's great i mean those are you can go back and listen to black sabbath all day long i mean they were the they set up the blueprint right right but if you're just absorbing that it maybe i don't know i mean personally i, I think it's interesting if you're also absorbing um, the, some of the stuff they were absorbing i mean like well, that's that i was they love the Beatles. that Ah, so glad you brought that up is a lot of, a lot of times that's how you get the new music, the new, the new sound. It's, it's combining everything. It's like, you can't just keep creating the new sound. I mean, I guess you can, what a, right. each their own music is, is very much, uh, it's an opinion, uh, how it's a, it's a taste, it's a flavor. It's, but there's beauty in all of it. Right. Cause it's all art. And, uh, but it's all pull like all your favorite artists, like, like you, like, or like, like what we're talking about here is, we stand on the shoulders of, of giants here, you know, like yeah. that it's, it, so it's great to pull from that too. I don't want to, you know, I, I want the, I want the whole spectrum, man. I want to know right. as much as I possibly can about everything. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I love that standing on the shoulder of giants. That's, that's how I, you know, we're just carrying the torch and we're going to pass it on to a, another generation eventually. And, and hopefully they'll have the same philosophy and continue and, and the, and the art form will continue continue to blossom because what you i don't think what either one of us would want to see is 20 years from now or whatever that it's just regurgitating what has already been you know yeah. that's i mean you can pay tribute you know you can you have Absolutely. bands that do that well and they kind of touch on a certain genre or a certain uh, time period and they do it well but yeah. you want to see that evolution and show show that homage where the where the influence right. is on your sleeves absolutely like right like carbon copies it's just it's if you're gonna do it, it's fine, whatever. But you know, we don't right. need to. We don't need to judge um, other people's art, how they come to it. But for, I think for, I could speak for you too on this. Uh, for guys like us, I don't think that that's what, what what our goal here is. Is it is to kind of pass the torch and, you know, on as you said, while we're here on this planet, you want to hear all that stuff. You want to be a part of it all and like, right. and being closed minded to oh, I'm only gonna listen to this or that. Just it cuts all that off. <laughs> yeah, you're not doing yourself any good, but we've all been there. I mean, it's funny, you were totally. talking about the punk rock period. And for me, it was, you know, like it was, it was, there was that period of metal, whatever. And it's like, it's not, it's not heavy enough. And, right. you know, and then you wake up one day and you're like, wait a minute here. That's like, but I like, I kind of like, and then you sheepishly tell your, your buddies, you're like, yeah, yeah but I also like I don't like this too. It's <laughs> just me. And then they're like, yeah, I like that too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a hundred percent. That's what that's ends up happening. Works. That's a hundred percent how it happens. And, and to that point, too, lastly, on that topic, it doesn't mean you stop listening or loving that hard rock stuff right. or anything like that. It's just there's more room. There's more room on the palette than just uh, just one yep. thing. And I, I want to make sure that we get each other's numbers at the end of this one because I want to exchange uh, some albums. We were saying I, I was telling you before about uh, my record collection that has mostly jazz and classical stuff that I inherited from my grandfather and uh, I, I remember we were talking about it. There's uh, some Dizzy Gillespie in there. There's some uh, um, Duke Ellington, um, a lot of Sinatra. There's like there's a lot of great records, uh, you know. And I want to I want to hear some of the cassettes, man. Now that I know you found some cassettes and cassette players, I want to know what's in that collection. I used to have a pretty wicked uh, cassette collection too. I have no idea where it's at these days, but I don't have a basement. We don't have basements in Orange County, man. So. <laughs> Well, it's good because basements flood. That's the problem with basements. <laughs> Trust me, I've learned learned my lesson there, and I'm hoping that all the the, hum, the humidity and all that hasn't ruined some of that stuff. But yeah, I've got these. I've got these tapes. I found these cassettes. I found, and and it's it's just so it's such a you know you you open up the little box and you get the same feeling that you, you got when you were playing. I'm like, oh my gosh, I haven't seen this forever. Like, I didn't even know I had this anymore. Mm. Um, yeah, that's the beauty of it, you know. Now, that's part. Is it like the now when you have the cassettes? Is it like the the chrome look to them with like just like a a, a piece of tape on it, or you got the black plastic? What kind of what kind of tapes were you recording on there? They were like they were so they're the kind of the the see through ones, and then there were the see through ones, the yeah. old school ones, which were full on black plastic. Yeah. Um, but then there are also just the ones you buy, like 
And then so he put the, the you, white did you ever ones. put the, oh, you bought the blank ones. So sometimes. Well, no, there were the blank ones, ones, but they're also the, like the ones you buy from the record company, you know, with the, yeah. some, which were like, you know. Did you ever do know. the scotch tape uh, trick on, on any records? Y yeah. Where you cover the, the, the cover the two en ends yeah. so you could record over it yes. like on a rec yes. on a tape that you didn't like anymore or, or sometimes as, as you were recording music, as, as you're saying, there would be like, you know, those sample tapes, cassettes that came through, like some, some other people might remember sample CDs. They had the sample tapes that literally had one song. They're singles, but they would, they would send them in the mail. Like for whatever reason, you would get like this, this cardboard sleeve and this shitty cassette tape. Right. And instead of like, you listen to the song once, you're like, that song's terrible. And then you just like <laughs> cover it up and use it to record a song you heard on the radio or record a song that you're working yeah. on. Yeah. <laughs> Although it makes me wonder now, given our conversation, how many of those that we covered up that we would listen to now and be like, oh, that's good. You know, like oh, we, totally. We, 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 I would yeah. go back to it now and be like, man, I'm so bummed I did that. <laughs> exactly. I can't believe I recorded over Miles Davis kind of blue. What, what was I <laughs> I hope I didn't do that. I don't know. I was pretty young. Yeah, no, you don't want to do that. That's yeah. blasphemy. But <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, it's been an amazing to have a conversation, get to know you even better, man. It's, yeah. it's really, this is uh, this is feeling like a good, long lasting friendship, man. I appreciate definitely, the time. definitely. I Things wanna, happen for a reason. Yeah, dude, absolutely. Um, well, well, I'm gonna get your number in a second when we hit when we stop the record here. But lastly, I gotta get back. We're kind of tying in that sure. that rock star thing. Last we left off, yeah. You got the you got the gut ready to put the beer can on, and, and you're, you're dueling up with the the great Mark Wahlberg, um, looking jacked as hell. Um, and uh, let, let's go from there on the story. Yeah. So if I remember correctly, we we wrapped that that night, and I'm walking back to the trailer. Sun's kind of going down. Now keep in mind, everybody kind of showed up for this night of filming because the bands were there and there's all these people and kind of excitement and Jennifer Aniston is in the film. And so she was at the time married to Brad Pitt. And so I'm, I'm walking back to the trailer kind of with my, you know, head down. Cause I still haven't gotten used to wearing this stuff yet. And I feel kind of, kind of funny, but <laughs> then I look up and there's Brad Pitt just walking right by me and just kind of like, kind of looks at me and, kind of looks me up and down, kind of smiles like okay you know i just felt i felt i was just like I, so it made you brad pitt made you feel about this big. yeah exactly <laughs> exactly exactly in all but fairness he, miles though i'm sure most of most of us men standing next to uh uh brad pitt especially at that time probably even now would feel about that big so oh yeah yeah <laughs> the, he definitely was beaming movie star yeah he's it, he's one of those guys who comes on the the TV or the movie, my wife, you know, the ladies love Brad. <laughs> I don't even, I don't even blame him though, man. I've, I've watched oh, yeah. all of his movies. He's a great actor on top of it. He is. Which makes you almost be like, God, some guys just get it all right. Like, like me, you know, but, um, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does. And he also seems to have like a big heart. I, I, I like the fact that he's done, you know, he's done good things. He's, yeah. he's, he's, he's got altruistic motives. He also has, he seems to have good taste in music and he's also like an architecture fan. And I love architecture as well. And he's really into that whole scene. So he, yeah, he seems like a good, well-rounded human being. So props yeah. to him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, just getting that look from Brad Pitt. <laughs> yeah, I was, I'll never forget it. I, I'm, I'm understanding more and more why we haven't seen Miles Kennedy in a movie. <laughs> movie. <laughs> Since, the, the way that you're describing a lot of it, like, it was great, it was great, it was great, but then Brad Pitt walked by. <laughs> <laughs> boo, 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 boo. <laughs> No, uh, dude. Again, such a great conversation. We could do, we could keep this thing going for another two hours. I know Absolutely. that we'll have you back on. We'll do a follow up phone call. All those wonderful things. But uh, I'll let you get back to the rest of your day, in Mozart, and we'll, we'll we'll be in touch, brother. Right on. Right. Thank you. Cheers. Well, that'll do it for this week's episode of Drinks with Johnny. Thanks to Miles for being a great person and doing this for a second time. It was an absolute great conversation. We'll be doing a follow up phone call with Miles on the podcast side so if for whatever reason you're here on youtube and you don't listen to the podcast you don't know why go listen to the podcast follow uh subscribe whatever they say these days to the podcast it's streaming everywhere and on thursdays or fridays sometimes we do a follow-up phone call with this week's guest so make sure you're subscribed and following that so you don't miss it and uh that's it for this week so until next time cheers